share my screen now. I hope you can see the slide on enriching sexual distillation. So this is the second type under the special cases of rectification. So last meeting we've discussed the stripping section distillation and the enriching section distillation. Just for a minute or so, can I ask somebody to uh, distinguish with just one uh, particular characteristic the enriching section distillation from the stripping section distillation uh, just to have a uh, simple recall of the two processes both under the special cases of rectification who can uh, give that difference or who can distinguish one from the other we have discussed it last meeting uh, it could be anything which you think differs one from the other, that distinguishes one over the other. What do you think is the difference between enriching section distillation and the stripping section distillation? Okay. Uh, let me ask Isa. What can you recall regarding the differences? Or you can just give one difference. One for each for enriching section distillation and stripping section distillation. From the stripping section, miss, the more volatile component is removed and back, uh, up to the uh, enriching section. Uh, you're, you are meaning the stripping section distillation? Yes, miss. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, but that's very crude. How can you give me one distinguishing characteristic of enriching section and stripping section distillation? From the terms itself, we will be able to distinguish one from the other. Uh, Jericho, can you distinguish one from the other? What can you recall regarding enriching section distillation and stripping section distillation? From what I recall, Miss, in the stripping column distillation, feed is introduced at the top while for enriching it, the feed is introduced, uh, it enters the bottom part, Miss. Okay, what is the state of the liquid in stripping section distillation? Can you recall? Saturated liquid. Okay, yes. as for the enriching section? Vapor. Okay. Thank you, Jericho. So that's it. So for a very simple uh, manner of distinguishing one special case of rectification from another. So in terms of the state of the feed, for stripping section, your feed is saturated liquid. For the enriching section, your feed is saturated vapor. Now, in stripping section distillation, just like what Jericho said, your feed is introduced on top of your column. Primarily because you don't have a top portion of the column because you only have the lower part. In the case of the enriching section distillation, you have the feed introduced at the bottom because you don't have also the bottom part of your column. Both is able, so both of these special rectification processes are able to separate the more volatile component from the other. So we have discussed the graphical interpretation of these two special cases of rectification, which really requires that if there's a need for you to determine the number of stages for these special cases of rectification, you have to really uh, uh, be provided with the equilibrium diagram and you should be able to plot correctly your feed line together with the corresponding operating lines that you need for these two special types. Okay, so I did not go into the process of how you come up with the number of steps or stages because it was fully covered at the time we are discussing the topic. Now to move on, so the third type of special rectification, I will just scroll down is the rectification with direct steam injection. So the steel itself now has steam injected to it. 
So the reboiler exchanger in this case, the one that is responsible of turning a portion of the collected liquid at the bottom of the steel into vapor is not anymore present. Primarily because you already have the steam injected into your column in the form of small bubbles. So this particular type of rectification requires an extra fraction of the stage since your step starts below the y equal to x line. So I will show to you later the interpretation of this special case of rectification. So meaning... Uh, for example, in your usual distillation process or rectification process, you have, let's say, example, 3.6 number of stages. So for this particular special case wherein you have steam directly injected at the bottom of your column, you will need an extra fraction of stage. So probably it could be like 3.8 or 3.9 or even 4. There's an added fraction of the steps because this time, the way you draw your, your steps in determining the number of stages starts or goes beyond the y equal to x line. Okay, I'll show that to you later after we're done with the last bullet in here. Now, this is the advantage of simple construction of the heater. So, meaning in here, you don't need the reboiler, so you simply have the steam directly injected into your column. So, in terms of construction, there's no need for you to have another auxiliary equipment, but you still need, of course, the condenser on top of your column. Now, to illustrate this particular thought in here, in the red ink, okay, in red font, this is the special case of rectification with direct steam injection. Now, if you notice, class, we normally... And whatever type of distillation we're talking about, the stripping section operating line is right on the 45 degree line. So if I annotate it somewhere here, it should be drawn in here. In the case of this particular type of rectification, you don't need to project the small fraction of the bottom's liquid on the 45 degree line, but it's right on the horizontal axis. That is why you have this extra fraction this is the extra fraction that is being mentioned uh, in the statement in the previous slide. So this is the extra fraction added to your number of stages because you don't draw your sleeping section operating line starting on the 45 degree line. <clears throat> Excuse me. But rather, it's drawn right on the horizontal axis. But in terms of the plotting of the other operating lines, Referring to the enriching section, this one, which is being cut, and the feed line or the Q line, the processes are still the same. So we only have this light modification in here uh, for plotting the stripping section operating line. The counting of the number of stages is still the same as with the normal rectification process. You only have to add this fraction here. So if you're going to color that fraction, this is the fraction that is added because we have started in here for our uh, X sub W plotting. Okay? So this is for rectification with direct steam injection. So enriching section operating line is the same with indirect steam. And the sleeping section operating line now, which we normally don't need when we do material balances, has a different form if compared to the sleeping section operating line starting here on the 45 degree line, uh, plotting of the X sub W. Now, let me clear my markings there. So we go to the next. Now, this is the fourth type of special rectification. So this is for your rectification power with side stream. So there's a side stream, as I will show it to you. This is your side stream in here. There's a withdrawal in this portion of your column, depending on the concentration of the, the feed or the concentration of the vapor, whatever it is that needs to be withdrawn, that is so desired. So that particular location where the side stream is to be uh, 
withdrawn from your column is governed by that particular objective, what particular concentration you want. So most of the time, this is in the form of a saturated liquid, just like the distillate here, which was also saturated liquid. Okay, so let me read on that particular portion on with uh, side stream. So this case arises when intermediate product or products or side streams are to be removed from sections of the tower between the distillate and the bottoms. So side stream, as I have mentioned, may be liquid or vapor, which can be removed either above the feed entrance or below, depending on the desired composition. So also mentioned. Now you can read more on this in uh, your handbook on section 13-18. And I have already shown to you a while ago what is the scenario for this one, for your steel or for your column that has a saturated side stream liquid withdrawn on top of the feed plate. Okay, so it's in the enriching section where it is being withdrawn. But it could be also here in the stripping section. Again, depending on the composition that is so desired. In terms of the balances that we're going to do, you have to do, although this is not given most of the time because distillation problems, even in the board exams that are given, only has three uh, strips present. So most of the time, it's just the feed, the distillate, and the bottoms. Just in case this will rise up so you would know that this is the rectification with direct uh, steam withdrawal. A stream withdrawal, rather. Now, in here, you could see the material balance, the V sub S plus 1 equated to the sum of the L sub S plus the O plus the D. Now, where was this taken from? Actually, this is just an example. For example, you want to do material balance in this section. So if you do material balance in this section, you could see that O and D are being withdrawn because these are streams that are leaving this section. The only stream that is entering this section or fed to this section is the V sub S plus 1. L sub S is also leaving. So that is why when you do material balance on that particular set section, this is your material balance. But it's not always the case, class, that you do material balance in here. So if your side stream is somewhere in here, it is, of course, more practical that you do your material balance on the stripping section. And that would include already the feed. Okay? Now, in here, since it's on top of the column and we consider the feed to be part of the stripping section, you notice there's no feed that is included in the box where you do material balance. Because feed most of the time is part of the stripping section and it's really part of the stripping section. So if ever you do material balance in your column, part by part, the feed will be part of the stripping section. That is if this side stream is in here. Okay. Now since it's drawn in here, that is why the material balance is like this. Now, the material balance on the most volatile component can be written like this. Or like this, that is, if you want to, uh, shall I say, account for the presence of the most volatile component in the liquid phase, so you only consider the liquid phases. If you want to account for its presence in the vapor phases, so you only have these two. Okay, still referring to this particular section that we are doing the material balance. Again, these equations are dependent on the section that you have selected. Now, when you write for the uh, material balance, so you, these are your material balances, material balance equations. When you write the operating line for the side stream, remember we have an operating line for the feed, we have an operating line for the enriching section, and we have a separate operating line for the stripping section. In the case of this rectification with side stream, we have another operating line. And that accounts for the presence of the side stream L sub S. Uh, in this case, our side stream rather is not L sub S but rather O because L sub S is the liquid leaving this particular section. So this is the equation of that particular operating line. Now, if it's to be interpreted graphically, the reason why it's not given most of the time because it's really complicated is that you have something like this already. 
whenever you are shown this graphical interpretation wherein there are already four lines that appear in your equilibrium diagram for your MacKay-TL plot, you already have this one here. You see this line? This is the added line that accounts for the side stream O. This is your original enriching section operating line. This is the original stripping section operating line. But this time, you plot the uh, side stream operating line in here, connecting, connecting the intersection of the stripping section and the feed line, and of course, its intersection with the enriching section operating line. We don't do any more or we don't cover any more the interpretation, the McCabe-TL interpretation of this particular type of special rectification. But since it's included in the topic under destination in our text, I just included it in here for your reference, just in case you will encounter a scenario similar to it wherein you have a side stream. Of course, if your uh, side stream class is in the stripping section, this added line will be in here. It's below your feed line because it's already in, uh, it's already part of the stripping section. It's in here because it's part of the enriching section. Okay, probably you'll be asked a concept uh, type question regarding it and you know how to answer such. Okay. Now, we go to, so we have uh, four types of special rectification. So we have the stripping section, we have the enriching section, we have the direct steam injection, and the one which has the side strip. So there were four that is covered in John Kuklis and also found in your handbook. Now we go to the concept of the partial condenser. This is very important because there are problems that says that your auxiliary equipment on top of your column is not a total condenser, but rather a partial condenser. So this is a, an illustration of this particular partial condenser. And alongside here, I snip this from John Kuklis. You could see that if you have a partial condenser class, the first stage that you have drawn in your uh, McCave TL plot is not part of the column but rather the condenser stage. So this is only for the partial condenser. If you recall, I mentioned, if you can recall, I mentioned that uh, in the case of a particular scenario, you will not be only subtracting one from the theoretical number of stages, but you will be subtracting two. And that case is this one, the special case of the partial condenser. You subtract two, from the steps that you have drawn on the McCabe TL because your upper step is for the partial condenser and the lower step is for your reboiler. If you're given a total condenser class or if the problem is not mentioning at all, if it's a partial condenser, it's okay that you will assume that it's a total condenser. Then you will only subtract one from the steps that you have drawn in your McCabe TL plan. But if it's stated that it's really partial condenser, you will subtract two. Now, what about this partial condenser? I think you already have an idea in part what this means because the term is partial, partial condenser. So it uses, uh, it's used in the case wherein the overhead distillate product is removed as vapor instead of liquid. So your distillate is not a saturated liquid but rather a vapor. So take note of that. Now, you may wonder why will you, or why will such a rectification process exist wherein your distillate is vapor, not liquid? So, this is used when low boiling point of the distillate makes complete condensation difficult. So, meaning the vapor that is collected on top of your column or that goes up on top of your column is a low boiling point vapor and as such, 100% condensation is not possible. So in such cases, you withdraw your distillate as vapor, not as liquid. So liquid condensate, that part that was condensed, is returned to the tower as reflux, while the one or the part that is not fully condensed as liquid is removed na lang as vapor. Why? Because as stated in here, your 
the vapor is very low boiling point, condensation is impossible or 100% condensation is impossible. So rather than exhausting a lot of energy uh, for your condenser to have all the vapor condensed into liquid, it's withdrawn along as vapor. The part that is uh, condensed into liquid is the reflux liquid now. So it's still rectification because you have still the, uh, the, uh, the use of the reflux liquid. So there is still reflux liquid returned back into the column. Now, when the time of contact between the vapor product and the liquid is sufficient, the partial condenser is considered another theoretical stage. Now, class, when you're given a partial condenser in a problem, it need not, uh, need not be that you can read this specific phrase. For it's not needed that the problem would really specify that the time of contact between vapor and liquid is sufficient. If it's already a partial condenser, automatically you subtract two from the uh, theoretical number of steps that you can see as plotted in your McCabe TL diagram. Okay, so you don't need to look for this. That way you can subtract two. Uh, even if this is not stated, you have to subtract two from the number of stages. So when is this used? When your vapor is really low, has really low boiling point, that 100% condensation is not possible. Okay? So we have the partial condenser and the most common one is the total condenser. So this is the most frequently used setup, the most frequently used uh, auxiliary equipment uh, at the top of your column. So this equipment condenses all the vapor from the column and supplies both reflux and the distillate product. So concentrations in this case of the vapor at the top plate the reflux and the product are all the same. So whatever is the concentration of the vapor that went up the column, that is the concentration also of the liquid that is withdrawn as distillate or that's your product. The same also is the concentration of the reflux liquid that is returned into your column. Okay, that's for the total condenser. So in cases of... Uh, there is a special mention of the partial condenser, you will know what's its implication in the theoretical number of stages. Okay, so we move on. There aren't any questions. So we go to tray efficiencies. Uh, if you have noticed class, I always use the term theoretical number of stages. So meaning by design, theoretically, uh, whatever is a uh, Determined analytically using the procedures we have discussed, like the Kinsky's method, the Herbar Maddox uh, diagram, the Kirk Bright equation for determining the number of stages on top and below, your feed plate, something like that. So, whatever process you do, you use in determining the number of stages, it's the theoretical number of stages. It's based on empirical data and it's based on diagrams. So theoretically, that should be the number of stages. However, in actual processes class, even if you follow by, by computation the number of stages by design as, as per what you have computed, the degree of separation that, that you intend to uh, achieve for your distilling column is not achieved. Why is that? Because there's no equipment that functions 100% efficiently based on the design it was made to function or follow. So what happens is even though theoretically, let's say for example, for a distillate which is 99% benzene, you should have let's say 14 theoretical number of stages. In the actual case class, it's not 14 that will achieve 98 or 99%. It's higher than that. So that's where tray efficiencies comes in. Your trays in your column, as I have mentioned, since it's part of your equipment, and that's the particular or specific part in your distilling column that accomplishes the function of intimately contacting 
the solid in the liquid, if it does not function 100%, then we have to account for its efficiency. How efficient is your tray or your stage uh, in contacting the liquid and the vapor? Because if it's 100% efficient, the objective of attaining a certain percentage for your distillate will really be achieved. And it's said to be having an efficiency of 100%. So if not, we have to account for or we have to know the actual needed number of stages for the particular degree of separ separation that we want to achieve for our quadro. So this comes in now, the concept of tray efficiencies. Right? So if the time of contact and the degree of mixing in a tray or stage is insufficient. Now the streams, referring to the liquid and the vapor, leaving the stage will not be equilibrated. This results to a tray or stage efficiency of less than 100%. And this is often the case. And in for all equipments, there are no equipments that functions 100% efficiently. So if stage efficiencies is less than 100%, the number of aqua stages to be, to be used to achieve the desired separation will be a lot more than the theoretical number of stages determined. So by design, what you have determined is still kulak for a particular degree of separation. Because of this, if the time of contact and the degree of mixing of your phases is not sufficient or insufficient, now we go to tray efficiencies. <laughs> now the shall I say the the ma the the overall tray efficiency is the simplest of all efficiencies that I will be discussing in the next slides, but uh, it's not as accurate as the others. So if you notice, if you will encounter problems later on. There will be a mention about the overall tray efficiency, but the commonly mentioned tray efficiencies, especially for the ceiling columns, is the more free tray efficiency or the more free efficiency. Now, let's going to look first into the simplest of all these tray efficiency. And I think this is more uh, straightforward, but is not accurate. It's not an accurate representation of how efficient is your particular tray or stage in your column. The overall tray, tray rather efficiency or plate efficiency. Now this is a macroscopic macro, kabilugan na siya, a macroscopic measure. It's a, the least fundamental of the other efficiencies and this concerns the entire tower. Why? Because you could see here that it's just the number of ideal tray, trays so this is the theoretical number of trays. The ideal trays are the theoretically accounted for trays divided by the actual that is needed. So that gives you the overall tray or plate efficiency. And you can see here the ratio. And that's how simple it is. Though it can still be a representation of how efficient is your column but it's the least fundamental. Meaning, kung least fundamental sa class, hindi siya as accurate compared to the others. Now, we go to the other way of expressing efficiency. So, the most commonly used tray efficiency is this one, the more free tray efficiency represented by E sub M. The overall tray efficiency is represented as E sub O. Now, you have here the more fractions. You can see y's uh, in the formula. So, y sub n, y sub n plus 1, and y sub n asterisk. And they are all defined in here. You can find this also in your uh, handbook in this section here, equation 13-29. So, your y sub n uh, is the average actual concentration of the mixed vapor leaving tray N. So we're talking about a specific tray N and we take the average concentration of the mixed vapor leaving the particular tray. Leaving. 
So the Y sub N plus 1 is also the average aqua concentration of the mixed vapor, but these are vapors entering your tray N. So Y plus N, a uh, Y sub N plus 1 is the vapors entering. Y sub N is the vapors leaving particular N. Now the asterisk has something to do with the vapor in equilibrium with the liquid leaving the tray. Okay, that particular tray, in this case, we're talking about tray N. It's defined in here. The concentration of the vapor in equilibrium with the liquid leaving the tray to the down cover. Now, this down cover class is just a guide comparable to some, uh, to a vap, a baffle, but it's inside the distilling column. It's on the side. It's, gui it's guiding the liquid to allow gas and liquid as it flows downwards. So that's the down cover. So Y sub N as there is, is that mole fraction of the vapor that is in equilibrium with the liquid that is leaving tray N. So the asterisk here tells you that this now considers equilibrium condition. Okay? Now, this is your formula for more free tray efficiency. Oftentimes, class, we don't solve this. This just simply gives you the formula of how it is to be solved, but the problem more oftentimes give you the value of the more free efficiency or the more free tray efficiency. Okay, to continue, there's another more uh, of these efficiencies. If we have the more free tray efficiency, which considers a particular tray in your column, and the tray is tray N, generically represented as tray N, the even the more accurate way of expressing efficiency is the point or the local tray efficiency or the more free point efficiency. If the other one is more free tray efficiency, this one is the more free point efficiency. It does not only account for the average of the concentrations on a particular tray N, but rather this time it's even going to the microscopic level because it's because it's now looking into a particular point in that tray N. But that is why it's saying here more free point efficiency. What do you have here? You have already the same formulas that you have in the more free tray efficiency, but they have now the primes. It's now considering a particular point in tray N. So they are all defined in here. So what are these Y's? Concentration of the vapor leaving a specific point in tray N. So it's now very specific. And N plus 1 subscript is concentration of the vapor entering the same point on tray N. So the same with the Morphe tray efficiency. Only that we don't get the average of the vapor uh, vapors that leaves a particular tray. But rather we're specific on a particular point of the tray. What about the Y sub N asterisk that you see here? Concentration of the vapor in equilibrium with the liquid leaving at the same point mentioned above. So, basta ang ginaistoryahan diriya a particular point in a specific tray N, not just tray N, for your more free point efficiency. In a such class, we can see that in terms of uh, which of the three now, if you're going to be asked, which of the three now will be more accurate in terms of expressing how efficient is your column, it would be this particular efficiency, the more free point efficiency. But oftentimes, though it's the most accurate, the problem would surface with just the more free tray efficiency. Oftentimes, as per my experience, it's the more free tray efficiency that is given. Okay? But this one is more accurate. Now, if you're going to compare the three uh, in terms of what this Y sub N prime, Y sub N asterisk represents, this is the representation. 
your Y sub N takes the average concentration of this vapor leaving Phi N. Your Y sub N plus 1 takes the average of these vapors entering Phi N. As 2Y prime, it's now a specific point in the column that you are taking this particular concentration. And that is small fraction, a particular point of tray N. Okay, the mentioned about the down camera, this is the down camera. That's where the liquid is flowing down the column. Okay, so ang kwasang liquid class, it goes down here, it flows horizontally, then goes down here. In the process of it flowing horizontally here in your particular tray, it contacts with the vapor that flows up and passing through the holes here. The bub uh, and they are now in the form of bubbles. Okay, this tray have holes and that's where the vapor passes through, contacting the liquid that passes through this particular tray. Okay? Now, do you have any questions so far? So we have three efficiencies. Overall, the Morphe and the Morphe point efficiency. Now, these are simple generalizations taken from the efficiencies if we're going to compare them and if we're going to look into the concentrations that are being used. Okay? Now, Y sub N prime cannot be greater than Y sub N asterisk. So, the more fraction at a particular point in, in tray N cannot be greater than the uh, more fraction of the vapor in equilibrium with the liquid leaving that particular tray N. As such, local efficiencies cannot be more than 100%. So your more free tray efficiency or the local efficiency cannot be more than 100% because of that fact. Now on small diameter towers, the vapor flow sufficiently agitates the liquid so that it is uniform on the tray. So referring to the vapor flow, which makes the concentration of the liquid leaving the tray the same as that on the tray making the point efficiency equal to the Morphe efficiency. So this is in the case of small diameter towers will, uh, wherein your point efficiency will be equal to the Morphe efficiency. Now it is expected that in large diameter towers, since the Morphe point efficiency, efficiency rather will be more accurate than the Morphe tray efficiency, then we say that the value that you will be getting for the Morphe efficiency is greater than the Morphe point efficiency. Why? Because this one is more accurate. I'm referring to E sub M P than E sub M. So naturally expect that you will be getting a value for E sub M which is higher than E sub M P. Okay? So that's it if you're going to compare the efficiencies if we're talking about small diameter towers and large diameter towers. Now we move on. How is the overall tray efficiency uh, related to the Morphe tray efficiency? So there's a formula that is given by Jan Kuplis relating the overall tray efficiency to the Morphe tray efficiency. So if we have the values of the slope of the equilibrium line, that is if the relationship is <coughs> class between the more fraction in the liquid and in the vapor phases being constant, so you will have a line. So if this is constant and you have also the slope of the operating line, the ratio of the L and the V. Uh, in, the, in the totality of your column, the ratio of the L and V is constant. The same thing with the slope of the equilibrium line. If this information class is given by the problem and you are given the overall tray efficiency, you'll be able to find the Morphe tray efficiency or vice versa. Given the Morphe tray efficiency, you'll be getting the overall tray efficiency. Okay, 
That is if we have this scenario. So this particular formula, okay, you read on the Jan Publis, only applicable in this particular, in this condition here. Slope of equilibrium line is constant and slope of the operating line is also constant. Okay, now how are we supposed to, let's say, associate more free tray efficiency with overall tray efficiency? Now, graphically, I'll show to you something. Uh, Isa knows this. My students before knows this one. So this is the McCavetiel way of estimating. So this is just estimate. This is just an estimate of the uh, actual number of trays given the given the what given the more free tray efficiency again this particular uh McCabe cell diagram in estimating the actual number of trays can be done if you are given the more free tray efficiency now that more free tray efficiency you will use in what will you do? You construct this new equilibrium curve based on that particular more free tray efficiency. Now, we will not be doing this anymore, class, because this is a very tedious process. This is time consuming. My suggestion is you read this portion either in McCabe or John Puplis on how this curve is constructed. Because your operating lines, you do the same. You write the operating lines in here, the three, including the feed line. And you construct this new equilibrium curve based on the Morphe tray efficiency. So E sub M, ha, you read that. How is this point A, B, and C uh, plotted in here? And how is this curve constructed? I leave that to you as an assignment to read in any of those two textbooks because you'll be uh, anyway having a very clear explanation on how is that accomplished once you have the equilibrium curve in here based on the morphe tray efficiency you are to draw steps still starting on the enriching section operating line and ending on the sleeping section operating line or beyond that so you instead of let's say you start here, what do we do normally is we go straight to the equilibrium curve like this. In the process, what we get is the theoretical number of stages. So I will just draw so you will understand. Wait, I can't find my stylus. Okay, class. Okay, so what you have here actually, class, if you are, if you don't still have this equilibrium curve, is you have this, it's extended here, you start in here, and it's extended here, like that. Okay, that's what you do. Then, you know this because you are given it based on this, like that. You plot the, sorry, you, you, you end on the operating line. So I have extended here, just in So we go down until this line here. You can see that line. Then we go sides down here until that line. Go here. Go, go down. Go in here. And then go down. So more or less, that's where you, this would be your theoretical number of stages. The yellow one. If you have the uh, equilibrium curve, you would draw it like this. You only end here. You don't extend here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Notice what happened here last is, since the last stage, the last stage is not part of your column, it is extending until the original equilibrium curve. It's not ending here. It's not ending there. 
but rather extending until the original term because that's primarily because the last stage that you are going is not part of your formula. This is your reboiler. Okay? So that's part of your reboiler. So that's the reason why you don't end here but you extend there. But that's only on the last stage already. So the black ink that you see is the aqual. So the end aqual is this black steps here that ends on the new equilibrium curve that you have drawn. You are the one who is making this by hand. So it does not necessarily mean that all the points that you have drawn here, uh, here you will pass through. It's just like the best fit curve on the points that you have determined yourselves. So it's important that you read that particular portion in your book that tells you of the procedure on how this particular point here, this particular point here, this particular point here was selected. That way you can draw a smooth curve on those points which will give you the actual number of stages. So since this curve is nearer your 45 degree line, you expect that your number of stages here will be higher than the one that I have drawn in yellow because this, uh, this is your theoretical number of stages. Okay? So this is how you do it graphically. Now we won't do it anymore, but rather you will be given the actual value of the uh, theoretical number of stages and you determine the efficiency together with the actual number of stages. Okay, that's just for your information. But nonetheless, it will be given a an assessment wherein you are interpret this particular diagram. So please do read that portion which explains how this curve was drawn. Okay, I will continue now. Now, the next part in here will be now determining the height. So this is now part of the design of your column. How high should be your distilling column? In determining the height of your distilling column, you will be using, I'd like to write your class, this end here is your N theoretical. But the way it's written in the formulas in your book, it's written as small letter N. But this is actually capital N with the subscript theoretical. So your theoretical number of stages, which most of the time now, I'm sure you will determine considering the analytical procedure of determining it. So the theoretical number of stages multiplied to the height equivalent to one theoretical plate will be multiplied and that should give you the height of your column or the height of the packing required to perform the given separation. This height of the packing also translates to the height of your column because the end here is already your number of theoretical stages. The height of the packing also corresponds to the height of the column itself. That is if you're uh, distilling column is so your distilling column by the way class could be made of trays or plates or it could be made of packing materials if it has trays or plates the in terms of design it is the distance between the plates that we are uh, uh, shall we say we make sure that that particular distance is followed between the plates but in terms of a column wherein you have packings inside uh, these packings can actually be random packing materials or structured packing materials i will discuss this in detail when we go to gas absorption because they have actually the same treatment there when your column is composed of this packing material the height of the particular height of this packing material is equivalent to one stage or plate when we have a plate or tray column. I hope you understand me. So I'll just uh, draw here something in red so you will understand. Let's say you have this column A here. And you have your packing materials, structured packing materials. It does not have plates or trays. 
And let's say you have another column B here. This time you have trays, which have either bubble cups. Bubble cups, they, they are holes in there, and in the holes are cupped. So my, in our language, no, my tan san siya class, I'll show to you the videos next time. So it's the same actually with gas absorption. So normally I don't cover it here because it's on the assumption that I have already covered gas absorption and heat and mass transfer. In your case, since we haven't touched it, I will be discussing it right after distillation and I will be showing to you these different types of, uh, shall I say, peripherals in figures in your column because it's the same with gas absorption. So if you have plates here, these plates have holes. And these holes are covered with bubble cups. Okay, so the gas are passing through the holes here, which have the bubble cups, and in the process they contact the liquid that flows horizontally. Here you have your columns, your down cover in here rather. So in this type of column, you know already that this is stage one. For example, this is stage two, this is stage three. So you can count the number of stages based on the number of plates or trays that you have. In the case of a column, a distilling column, which is having packing materials, you don't have trays. It's all packings inside the column. So there is a corresponding what we call height, a corresponding height, of this packing material, whether structured or random packing material, equivalent to one plate in here, if you were given a tray. This is the one that is referred to in here, the HEP3. So that is why in here, we have the efficiency of random pack and structured packing material. Because we're now considering a distilling column which has packing materials inside. So in here, you can determine the number of stages based on this height. It says here, the height equivalent to one theoretical plate. The height equivalent to one theoretical plate times the number of theoretical stages, of course, will give you the height of your distilling column. That is, if your distilling column is, of course, a packed column, which can either have random packing materials or structured packing materials. So that's the reason why you have an HETP, the height of packing material which is equivalent to one theoretical plate. If you're going to multiply it with the number of stages, then that's the height of your distillate column. I hope you understand the explanation. This will be very clear when I show the differences between these two. Uh, when we talk about packing materials and uh, this one, the trace in your column with bubble cups. But nonetheless, before I go to the next part of the slide, do you have any questions so far in here? So this is how we determine the height of our, deter, uh, of our distilling column based on the formula M theoretical times the HETP as defined in here. Do you have any questions? There's none. See you. So my time here is 1.29. I'll clear my markings here. I will give you a 10-minute break. So we'll have a breather here. Come back at 1.40. We will continue with the rest of the remaining slides. So this is slide 34. We'll be ending at slide 45. Okay? Just don't leave the Zoom room. You can have a 10-minute break. I will just stop sharing for now. Okay, I'll go back to our slides. Okay, so we're now... Where were we? We're here. Okay, not yet there. Okay, this is the part where we ended. Actually, the heading of the slide has some error to it. So for random pack and structured pack towers for distillation, this is how you determine the 
height of your distinct column, not the efficiency. We'll have this edit tag, and then we will just I will just uh, change the one that was shared to you in uh, Canvas. Okay. Now we'll continue on the next slide. Now it could be class if you are using Janko Please or Macave. Uh, there is a different formula or another suggested formula in determining the height of your column for distillation, uh, which uses random pack or structured packing materials. Now, that particular formula, actually, what I have wrote in, written in here is just the hog nog formula. But actually, there is another formula, which is the H with the subscript G and the N with the subs subscript G. The product of both of this, the hog knock and simply the H sub G and the N sub G still allows you to determine the height of the packing material that was used in your column, also translated to the height of your distilling column. So the hog knock here, uh, you can see is defined as the, if we go first to the hog, it's the overall height of the transfer unit and the nog report is the nog as the number of transfer units. Now, this is if you're looking at the, uh, the overall height of the transfer unit. So, this is your formula in determining the height of your column. There's another formula I've mentioned. I did not place it in here, but you will encounter that formula as well in gas absorption. So, actually, to uh, specify the height here in gas absorption, we use Z. The height of the column. We can also use Z in here. So this could also be Z. That way you'll not get confused while you have an H here and you have this HOG and NOG on the right side. The Z represents the height of the column, whether we're talking of the distilling column or the uh, gas absorption column or the desorption column or the extraction column. It's the general representation of the height, which is the Z. Okay, if you're given the hog, because there are problems that gives you the value of the hog or the nog, then if you want to convert it to HETP, for example, you're given the hog and you already determined the theoretical number of stages. So for you to determine the height of your column without having to pass through determining NOG, because this one has a separate formula, a more detailed formula, then you can convert your hog value or the H with subscript OG value given in the problem to HETP. Once it's already in HETP, you can use the formula that I have shown to you a while ago. This formula allows you to convert the HAG to the HETP. However, class, these are the limiting conditions. Again, so the M, the slope of the equilibrium line, it has to be aligned. It has to be constant. Otherwise, you won't have one specific value here for the M. The same thing with the L divided by B. This L and B are your molar flow rates for the liquid and the vapor phases in your column. And this has to be given by the problem. Okay, so this has to be given by the problem. And the slope of the equilibrium line, so it has to be line, has to be given. Otherwise, if you're given the hog, you cannot have it converted to the HTTP. You have no choice but together with the hog, use the formula for the N sub OG or the NAG to determine the height of your column. Okay? Now, where do you get the formula for the NAG? It would be, uh, it's a... Uh, given in detail in John please the formula for the NAG that goes with the HAG. I think I was not able to place it in here because I already placed in here the conversion of the HAG to HETP. But should it be not feasible because you're not given this or the problem does not give you this information, then you have to determine the NOG to uh, be able to solve for the height of the column. So this is in the case, so again, you have two responsibilities now. You read the, the discussion on the how the equilibrium curve is constructed for the actual number of trays determination using the Morphe tray efficiency. And this is the second one. 
we have to determine or we have to find the formula for the NOG just in case this one is not feasible based on what the problem gave you as the information that you can use. Okay, so that's the second one that you're going to read. If you're going to read the sample problems that I have assigned at the end of the slide, you will be learning anyhow the rest of the formulas that uh, you would need to know to determine that way you find the height of the column. Now, the first two slides that I placed in here, I will clear my markings, all concerns the packing hours or a distilling column which has packing materials. Now, what if that particular packing column is not existing and what the problem gives you is a tray column? So, this is the formula that you will use for the tray column. Given the HTTP, excuse me, Pasha. My apologies, class. Huh? My, my daughter is also having a parallel class, a makeup class here, so very noisy. Now, where was I? I cannot also concentrate. Wait. Okay, better. Now. Where was I? So these first two slides that we have discussed are for the packing tower. You have packing materials in your distilling column. What if you have a tray tower? And what is provided is the HETP. So how will you be able to design your column in terms of the spacing, if you recall my discussion a few minutes ago? So if you have a tray tower, you will, your trays have to be properly spaced. For separation also to be possible. So the spacing is a function of the HETP if it were, if the tower has packing materials and the overall efficiency of the column. So for trace spacing, you will have here this one, the T. Uh, for a 0.5 meter tower diameter, the trace spacing that you should be using is 0.3 in here to get the HETP. Why always get the HETP? Because from the tray tower, which has already the spacing that you know, you will be able to determine the height of the column if it is converted to HETP. Your HETP together with the theoretical number of stages will allow you to determine the Z for this tray tower. However, the tray spacing of this tray tower has to be used accordingly. So as written in here, if you have a 0.5 diameter tower, it should be 0.3 that should be placed here for the capital T. If your tower diameter is 1 meter, it should be 0.6. And for tower diameters greater than 4 meters, you place here 0.8. So now, based on this formula, placing in here the tray spacing and knowing the overall tray efficiency, you'll be able to get the HETP. Again, we go back to the formula of determining the C using the HETP. So the HETP times the C, rather times the N theoretical, will give you the Z. Is that clear? Do you get it, class? Your formula for the Z of the distilling column is in terms of N theoretical and HETP. So if you have a tray tower, you're going to solve the HETP based on the spacing here, based on this important information here. So you have to uh, properly or select the correct uh, value for the tray spacing here depending on the tower diameter for your tray tower. That way, the equivalent tower of the tray tower could be determined using the HETP here as if it's using packing material then you can now determine the height of your distilling column. Do you understand what I mean? Can I see a reaction? Do you understand? Can you write in the chat box? Can you follow my discussion? Because there's no sample problem for this anymore. 
you will have to read sample problems that I have placed at the end of the slide. So it's important for me to know that you follow through my discussion. Do you get it? Do you get how to determine the Z or the height of your tray distilling tower by converting the given uh, tray spacing and overall tray efficiency to HTTP? Then you use your theoretical number of stages. Do you know? Do you understand already? I'll stop sharing. Okay, Jericho is having a reaction. I can't see any reaction. What about the rest? Do you follow? Okay. So it's really very important for me that you understand what I'm talking here. Otherwise, it's repeated. Okay, I'll go back to screen sharing. So that's it. Okay? You only have, actually, you only have three formulas to use. The big challenge here, class, by the way, I'd like to tell you, uh, the big challenge in here is the NOG. The NOG formula. Uh, when I assign you a reading portion in the book, so especially the sample problems regarding the NOG, please understand how you get the NOG that should be paired to your HOG. If it is impossible for you to, be, to convert the HOG here to HTTP. It would have been easier if the problem would just simply give you the HTTP and then you multiply it with the theoretical number of stages. The problem is some problems in distillation would give you the HOG which would really require you to find the NOG because not at all times will you be given this slope and this ratio of the liquid and vapor flow rates. If these are not known, so there's no way that you can convert the HOG that is given to HETP. You really have to use it. So for you to be able to use it, you need to know the NOG. So I'm stressing it over and over again, emphasizing it that you, so you will understand the importance. So please read what you have in your textbook because I cannot place all the formulas in here. Later on, I'll be giving a summary of formulas that you can use. Okay, so for the tray tower, there is no separate formula to determine the C, but rather we can convert the tray spacing to HTTP, then HTTP the theoretical number of stages. Okay, now specifically class, in Jan Kuplis, the different HTTPs for specific type of packing materials are given. So these are the equations that are very important for you to take note of. And all of this you can find in Jan Kuklis, the one that is colored black with the green stripe on top. So that's my book. So that's the fourth edition or the Philippine edition of Jan Kuklis. If you cannot find these particular formulas as you go over them later or in some other time, message me so I can give you screenshots. Uh, screenshots or snippets of the book where these equations are written because it's really like time consuming if all the equations I placed, uh, I encode in math type and then place in here. So what I did is write the equations in here only. Now it's really very specific, specific class because this time here, if HETP is not given, you have a formula to use for random Pack tower, and you have an HETP formula for structured packing. Once you, you already determine the HETP using this particular formula, then just multiply it with N theoretical. Now, for sieve and valve trays, this was not shown to you because this would have been covered in gas absorption. For sieve and valve trays, this is your formula for determining the HETP. Now, this one is for absorption tower, so it's not included in here. And for vacuum service, this is not also included in here. So your main concern are these equations. 11.5 does 11, 11.5 does 13, and 11.5 does 9. If the uh, HETP and the overall efficiency are not given, by the problem. So these are the formulas that you can use, all taken from Jan Kuklis. Now, 
if you can find an equivalent formula for these equations in MATLAB, I don't mind you using it as long as when you write your solution later on, you can specify the inform the source of the information that you use. Like I use table like this from MACAB or like this because I can go back to my book and MACAB and check. I use this table e equation ammonia from Jean Coupli so I can cost check it with what I have in here because I have those books anyhow. So it's important that you write down in your solution the source of the formula that you are using especially if it's not the one that are placed in here in our slides. Okay, if you're using even formulas that are already available in Paris, I don't mind as long as you tell me what the equation is and where do I find that particular equation. Okay, so this is specifically on determining the height of your distilling column. Because the height of your distilling column already constitutes designing your column. The last part in the topic of distillation. Okay, aside from, of course, the last two, which concerns the condenser and the repoiler units. Okay? I will clear my margin C. Are there are any questions. So we are now on the last part, and this is where the, this is the part where you're going to do energy balance. Okay, energy balance because we intend to determine the condenser and the reboiler duties. What are these condenser and reboiler duties? From the term condenser duty, it's the amount of heat that your condenser should be able to absorb from your vapor. That way, it's able to condense your vapor into liquid. The opposite of that is your reboiler duty. The amount of, the amount of energy that your reboiler should supply to your uh, liquid that was collected at the bottom of your column. That way, it's able to convert part of that liquid to vapor. That will be now the providing the vapor that will flow counter current to the liquid that is going down because that vapor is going up your column. Now, the formulas that you are seeing in here, it has already in copies, as you can see, and this particular formula was taken from the energy balance on the upper section of your column, and that's your enriching section. Uh, we are not really concerned on the derivation of this particular formula because it's really difficult for you to have it derived later on when you need such formula. It's just very important that you know where you can find that particular formula in your handbook or in a specific reference material if it's not written in your handbook. You just need to find its equivalent in your handbook. Now, in here, in this page, you could see the formula for the condenser duty. Okay, so this is the formula for the condenser duty. This is the operating line equation for the upper part of your column which is the enriching section operating line. And this is the general uh, energy balance equation on the entire enriching section. But the most important formula that I'd like to zero in here, zero in, in here is the condenser duty. So it has the V1, the H1, the L, the HD, the T, and the HD. The L is your uh, reflux liquid. It is multiplied to the enthalpy of the distillate, the D is the distillate, and you have here the enthalpy of the distillate. This B1 and this H1 is in here. So I'd like to clear the markings in here. Okay. Your V1 and your H1 is the vapor. The V1 is the vapor leaving the topmost plate of your enriching section, that is your column, and its enthalpy is the H1. Okay. You need this information that way you can solve for the condenser duty if the problem is requiring it. I've assigned a problem here at the end of this slide which you can read in detail how to determine the condenser duty and the reboiler duty. It's a sample problem in McCabe. John Cooplis does not give us any sample problem on how to 
account for the condenser and the recoiler duty. So, it's really only McCabe. And you might be surprised, class, nga laina ang mga representation ni McCabe ya kumpara sa kay John Kuklis if you are used to using and studying using your John Kuklis reference material. Always understand the representations of McCabe because it's really different than that of John Kuklis. This one has a sample problem which you can read. The reason why I'm not I'm not discussing even before so face to face this particular part of the topic because the procedure is really very long. It will really eat up time that if given time the students can just read based on the sample problem on the book. So this is your condenser duty formula. If we have a condenser duty formula, we also have the Reboiler duty. The reboiler duty formula is uh, made from the energy balance on the stripping section of your column. So this is the stripping section of your column. And this is the energy balance that you'll be doing there. It's always suggested that whenever a problem is asking for both condenser duty and reboiler duty, always determine the condenser duty first. Because you need the condenser duty in here to be able to find the reboiler duty. So your reboiler duty is now using the enthalpy of the bottom's liquid. Notice that the feed was included in here in the stripping section energy balance. So you have the enthalpy of the feed. And in here you get to see the enthalpy of the distillate and the condenser duty. Now... There are sample problems which you are to read, again, as I've said a while ago, related to the condenser duty and reboiler duty. And please read them because you also have your dry lab schedule to use. Okay? As for heating requirements, these are the last two. The heating requirement in the reboiler and the cooling requirement in the condenser. The heating requirement in the reboiler can be found only in your handbook. It's not found in John Kuklis. It's not found in McCabe. And since this slide constitutes already of the material, I only took the essentials of what you have in the two reference material in the handbook. So this is the formula for determining the steam consumption of your reboiler. That way, it's able to supply the needed amount of energy for your liquid to be turned into vapor, a portion of the liquid collected in a distilling column. So this is your formula for that. You have the vapor rate from the reboiler for the V-bar, the latent heat of the steam that is supplied in your reboiler, and the molar latent heat of the mixture. This one is also discussed in detail on how you're going to determine this. All in, I think this one is discussed in McCabe on how to determine the molar latent heat of the mixture. Just follow through the sample problems that I gave at the last part of the slide. This is for the heating requirement of your reboiler. For the cooling requirement, so we know that it's the condenser that needs to provide the cooling water for your vapor to turn into liquid. So these are your parameters in the formula. So you have the temperature of the cooling water that is supplied and its temperature after it has been used in the condenser and you need the specific heat of the water here. The problem does not give you this most of the time so we're just using the 4.184 or we can get the average of the two temperatures, the inlet temperature and the outlet temperature of the condenser. Take the average of that and use that as a basis for the specific heat of your water that is being used in your um, uh, condenser. So in determining the amount, what, this is actually the flow rate of the cooling water. So you have your temperature and the CP. Now this is the volume of the water that is being used and this is the latent heat of vaporization of your uh, vapor that is supplied to your, uh, not, not, not supplied, that is introduced into your condenser. This one, the lambda. Um, latent heat of the steam uh, is your lambda S. Okay?
these are the sample problems that you need to read later in your free time. You have the sample problems in McCabe to read, so please read it because they are all applications of the formulas that I have introduced in here. So you are to read them because they are already sufficient to, uh, to show to you how the formula are to be used or how they are to be uh, or how you're going to determine the required information in the problem, all based on the information that I have given you in the last part of the slide. You have also to read these sample problems from Jan please considering, I think this one I have chosen regarding the use of the NOG formula, HOG and the specific HTTP formula for the type of column that is given to you. So if I'm not mistaken, I will check. If you don't have those reference materials, make sure that you have even just the soft copy. If there's none, if there's no soft copy for you, let me know. So I'm taking the one in Maki from the seventh edition. So if there's no seventh edition PDF copy, let me know so I can take pictures of the things that you need to study. So chapter 21 on distillation has these sample problems on. So it's starting with 21.3. 21.3 is very short. 21.4 is also short. And you have only two in Jan Kuplis. Now for, for Jan Kuplis, let me check. Huh? So you only have two there. They are just short still uh, on the theoretical way of determining the ends and all, but it's very important that you read them. Uh, 736. Let me Okay, so the one I gave you for Jan this is the one that will illustrate the entropy balances. Okay, so it's very important that you read those 736 to 740. That's it. Okay, should you have any question, don't hesitate to ask me questions. Uh, the formula for the reboiler duties and the condenser duties were taken from a gentle piece. The heating and the cooling requirements are taken from your handbook. But since the handbook and the cave are cross-reference, if you notice, the representation in Paris is similar to the representation in the cave. So it's found in both references. So please study. Now, if you still have time, study beyond what is required for you to study. That way, you get to see the application of the equations that were shared to you this afternoon. Okay, this, ends, uh, this ends our topic on distillation. Uh, stop sharing for now.